Lily Gil Valera, the CEO of CM Plus and Culture Intel. And today I am delighted to be moderating this session for the Hispanic Leadership Summit 2020, focused on SDG 3. I couldn't think of a more critical and relevant SDG than good health and well being in the season of COVID 19. And of course, because this is the Hispanic Summit, we're going to dive deeper into the impact of COVID in our communities and what are some of those barriers that are getting in the way of good health and good outcomes and what can we do about it? And we have an amazing panel of experts that range all the way from the public to the private sector um, and many other expertises that we will tap into right now. But you know what, before we jump into some of the questions, I think it's important to set the tone because it's the COVID-19 era and we watch that ticker counter in a way when we're watching the news and it has the death rates and the hospitalizations and what's happening, which is, it, it, it's a bit concerning, right? When we look at these big bull numbers, but what does it mean to our communities? And let me share with you some of the findings and things that we've been studying in this era of COVID-19 as a cultural intelligence company. But first, let's start with the official numbers. This is pretty new if you look at it. Uh, just a few weeks back, the CDC stated bold and clear that the largest percent increase that we are seeing for COVID-associated deaths, excess deaths, are actually contributed by Hispanic deaths. So let's think about that. Unfortunately, because we don't have all the data broken down by ethnicity, we don't know the actual count, but we know what that net difference is when you're comparing and it's younger people. And I keep reminding people, we cannot look into COVID solutions and interventions by assuming that one size fits all, because if we look at hospitalizations by age and ethnicity, and we only look at one bar chart, sure, we gotta protect the elders. We gotta protect long-term care facilities and we need to put them first in line as we deploy the vaccine. But is that really the case? When for Hispanics, 51% of the hospitalizations are happening for people ages 18 to 49. We gotta understand why. Why are our communities being impacted in such a younger cohort of the population? And that is exactly why we went into analyzing data to try to distill the why. Why are the mindsets shifting? Why are these emotional barriers or barriers to seeking care or not believing in the vaccine getting in the way of communities at large, but especially ours. So let me give you some things to think about. Number one, unfortunately, our optimism that makes us notoriously happy and cheerful about life and the American dream has eroded when we are now 1.9 times more negative uh, towards just the ability to live life to its fullest with the financial wellness and the American dream that we are here for. But then when you also look at what is our perception towards let's say the vaccine, what you're looking at here is arguably one of the largest analysis of sentiment for the COVID-19 vaccine by ethnicity, gender, and generation. And look at us Hispanics based on 253,000 data points. Almost one in two in our community are either negative or neutral towards the vaccine. We gotta tackle these barriers, but what's underneath these barriers? In the case of Hispanics compared to other segments, we are concerned about the harmful consequences of this potential vaccine, the fact that it's in that unnatural, like here's one thing I want us to look at. We're worried about the financial implications. Who is taking the time to educate our communities and realizing that this is gonna be public health, that you can be covered. We don't even have the vaccine yet and our community is already worried about not being able to afford it. When you look at other segments here, well, there's a top three barrier to acceptance for others ranks last, like for the overall, for men, for women. So there's a lot of things for us to understand. I know this is a lot of information. It's an eyesore when you look at this chart. But my point is that without cultural intelligence into the way we deploy an inclusive approach to health, to health equity, to vaccine confidence, to interventions for better outcomes, we may not have the results that we need. And guess what? We cannot afford not to have the right results. And that is why we have the panel of experts right now. And I'm going to pass it on to them. So they can help us kind of break down these numbers, it's starting with understanding why is this disproportionate impact of COVID playing out the way it is for our communities? Why is it, and I'm gonna start with, uh, with you, Summit, as we look at 
the obvious consequences, higher hospitalization rates, two times more likely to die if you actually get COVID. Why is it, based on your experience, that we're seeing some of this now? And is it correlated to barriers in health that our community have even before COVID? Thank you, Lily. And by the way, amazing, amazing data slides that you presented. And I think one of the most telling ones was the bar chart. And, and we keep hearing, if you listen to any news channel, if you read any newspaper, you keep hearing 250,000 uh, American deaths. But I think the, the crux of the matter is you have to go beneath that to see what that really translates into. Because you just show that the age differentiation, the ethnic differentiation. So I think the problem at large is in front of us. And you're posing the right question and your slides also showed some of the barriers. But to, to look at it from a slightly different perspective is going beyond that. It starts with the mistrust I think some of the underrepresented communities do have. And it's not out of nothing. I think it is based on some realities of the past where experimentations were conducted without telling people, where informed consents were not properly carried out, where information was not shared, shared properly, where there's a lack of education of what medicines mean, how access can be provided, how we can actually do more uh, without necessarily having a financial impact on the societies. So I think they're, they're, that's just the starting point. The second part is healthcare provider differentiation and diversity in those healthcare providers. I've had uh, multiple conversations with leaders in the black community as well as some in the Hispanic community. And one of the common themes that I'm hearing about is patients really want to see and, and talk to people who understand them culturally and also the body language and also the language because they open up more freely and they share their thought process more freely. And today, honestly, there is that paucity of the diversity in the, in the uh, people or the healthcare provider community as well. Last but not the least, I think the socioeconomic strata and status also does play a role into it. So to me, these are just some of the barriers, uh, education, diversity in the treating population as in the healthcare providers and the socioeconomic side of things. And of course, we need to work a lot harder to bring back the trust in the society and in the communities. That's the starting point. Thank you, Samet. That is fantastic. And, and you know that one chart I shared that shows that 51% of hospitalizations amongst Hispanics are ages 18 to 49, unlike the common knowledge that the most vulnerable are our seniors, which I'm not discounting that, is that and younger Hispanics, but also essential workers, we're hearing so much uh, chatter these days because of the vaccine distribution and deployment that we gotta put essential workers first, but we often forget who really keeps America alive, AKA fed, which are our farm workers, right? Sylvia, this is what you do. And it's almost mm -hmm. like these silent heroes that are, are, are out of the radar in a way, and they're still showing up every day at the wee hours of the morning. So. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges these communities face and 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 are some of these numbers in hospitalizations maybe tied to the fact that there are many of our community members that are exposing themselves like the farm workers day in and day out for us? Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lily. And when you were showing that that uh, bar graph, it wasn't surprising to me because mm -hmm. many of our Latino uh, community members are essential workers and so they are exposed. They work in jobs where you can't zoom in, you can't work remotely. And so farm workers, um, they, they represent a very large number of workers across the United States, between two to three million farm workers across the United States that really create that infrastructure for our food supply. And more than I would, the majority of them, 80 to 90 percent are Latinos. And so when we're thinking about what are some of those challenges and barriers that this very unique population of Latinos is facing, um, and it's not just now during the pandemic, but historically, um, there are some inherent dangers in agriculture, some environmental and occupational risks. But then on top of that, when you look at, they, they primarily are in rural communities where access to care, access to healthcare services 
is very limited. And um, I think we've already heard some about the economic uh, crisis, some of the financial uh, implications of having low wages. Um, and then we talked a little bit, I think, already about some of the culture uh, and then the language. So some of these all become challenges for not only accessing care, but engaging in the healthcare process. And what we've learned through the pandemic is all of these had, have been heightened. They've been highlighted. We've identified additional gaps. And, um, and some things that when there's a public health crisis, um, there are emergency situations. So I'll give you an example. Uh, many farm workers live in congregate housing. And so um, as we think about some of the recommendations about social distancing, about quarantining, about isolation, if you are sick or you think you're sick, are very hard to do when you are in a place in an environment in which you really don't have a lot of control. It really is up to an employer to provide those that safety and uh, those measures that will protect workers. And so it just becomes, um, it there's additional barriers that we have identified and have had to deal with, especially with farm worker communities. Thank you, Sylvia, for that I feel like you're giving a voice to the voiceless that are keeping us uh, going as a nation. So thank you for your work. And um, going from the very big role of farm workers to a very big and complicated place like New York, um, which has been quite a bit in the news, right? Like we, we locked down, we were diligent I'm in New York City, right? You know, I, I talked to my friends in other places where my brother in Arizona, others in Texas, other places, and, and they tell me people are not as diligent wearing masks like we are here, New Yorkers and, and other things. But besides the public health things we see on television with our governor's updates, I want to ask Lisa straight from the source, what are some of those unique things you're seeing in your body of work that is impacting Hispanics in New York? Um, as, as you have seen this pandemic unfold right before our eyes. Yes, thank you, Lily. Um, well, here in New York, you know, as the governor himself says, uh, we really went from worst to first. So if you remember during mm -hmm. wave one, the city in particular really became the epitome and emblem of, you know, the ugly face of COVID and the devastating effects. And, you know, um, the, the governor and our team here has worked vigilantly, like, day and night, literally 24 seven, um, maneuvering as many specific operational strategies, everything from testing and contact tracing, um, you know, leveraging data, uh, making decisions that are fact-filled, um, you know, literally exercising, maximizing every tool that we have in our government toolbox um, across the state to keep New York safe. And it is, it is incredible. I think that if there's any state that has come close to cracking the code, we have. Um, we are now at a, you know, in December, before the um, before the holidays, we're seeing about 3.6% infection rate, which here in New York feels high, but we're still relatively low comparatively across the country. Um, unfortunately, however, you know, the gaps that we're seeing across health disparities here in New York, nevertheless, um, are reflective and consistent of the gaps that we're seeing across the country. Not as deep of a gap. Um, you know, New York is a state where there are lots of advocacy community groups that are vocal as they rightly should be. Um, but I think that, you know, like the, the secret recipe really is to have, you know, for one, the infrastructure and leadership, preferably of a governor, because really, you know, I think as a, as a Latino household, uh, Latinx um, individual, your zip code has never had a bigger impact on your life than right now. Like literally where you live makes a huge difference. Who's your mayor? Who's your governor? What community groups um, are accessible? Um, you know, how do you have health care? You know, like really like all the social determinants of health um, plus where you fit in the, in not only in the landscape of government, but almost like a political landscape, right? Because we are, we are seeing a divide between states where, I mean, you and I are both in New York, so if you walk down um, most streets in, in the city today in New York City, most people are wearing masks. 
if you're in a state in the Midwest, you know, and you go to like a big box retailer, once you're inside, people will be wearing masks, but not so much outside. So how can we begin to bridge those gaps? How can other states that are not adopting such stringent but effective protocols like New York, how can we as a community begin um, to strategically advocate on behalf of those protocols because they do work, but do it from coast to coast? Thank you so much. And I know definitely the world is looking into New York uh, more than one way. And um, unfortunately, health equity or health inequalities that were already there before COVID are, are almost getting augmented. It's like they were put now under a magnifying glass. They're not new, they were there. And I'm gonna kinda uh, ask uh, Dr. Ruby to dig deeper into that because clearly there is an issue on outcomes, underutilization of services. I know you work a ton in mental health. We've had the pleasure of work to get working together on mental health. Um, can you help those that are watching this maybe understand a little bit more of what is it that is driving some of this disproportionate impact or lack of, I mean, access to the services? Uh, I know you've done a ton of mental health too. So could you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, on that? Thank, yeah. thank you, Lily. Um, definitely the disparities in the healthcare um, are from the underlying medical conditions uh, to the health insurance. So the Hispanic people have higher risk of chronic diseases and health problems like diabetes, high blood pressure, asthma, obesity, and, they, and all of these conditions are linked uh, to more severe complication and death from COVID-19. This is one of the reasons why we can see this trend of more deaths in the Hispanic community. Also, the Hispanics um, may also find difficult to seek health um, health care when they need. The Hispanics are three times as likely as white to have no insurance, which may lead to them to worry about the cost of care, for example. Uh, the language and the cultural bar barriers that already mentioned uh, during the panel uh, is, is something that uh, add the challenging for Hispanics when they are communicated, communicating with the healthcare providers. Also, those factors cause um, the Hispanics to avoid seeing, um, seeing health healthcare and, and they are more sick and, and you can see that the difficulties when you have um you know the conditions that there is not a preventable but it, when you have um in addition to the economic pressure and health risk from hispanic people um they have also um to the they have to deal with um financial stress healthcare call job love um, job loss, et cetera. So I think there are too many um, issues there. there um, the Hispanic community, they have more risk to exposure to the virus um, because they are commuting to work in the public areas, um, close quarters. Uh, also, the Hispanic people may have to continue working to support their families in addition to um, other things, you know, we know that many Hispanic people have lost their job during the pandemic. So um, they are, um, there is a lot of emotional stress of, um, and, um, you know, of close living situation and um, they are really um, impacting the Latino community. Thank you so much, Rui. And just to put it again in perspective for some of you, if, if Hispanics happen to be more likely to be diabetic, it's uh, anywhere between almost two to three times more likely. And a diabetic patient, when they get COVID, is four times more likely to die. You do the math, right? You start seeing how comorbidities or disproportionate impact of, co of chronic disease piles up in the middle of a pandemic when you happen to be one of those that cannot be working from home. Um, and then you see those younger hospitalization rates. It's very interesting how you kind of see the public health story playing out. But I wanna flip it around. Can we brighten up the day? <laughs> Are there best practices? I, I, I am excited, uh, Summit, to dig into this one because I'm, I'm one of those kind of like pharma nerds that for the last 15 years has been looking at the fact that we have a lack of clinical trial diversity 
just to again put it in perspective, we diverse communities are 40% of the US population, but represent two to 16%, if we're lucky, of clinical trial participants. How can we know safety and efficacy of products, vaccines, medicines, if the future face of America is not represented in those trials? So when it comes to trials, how do we fix this? I, I'm just gonna throw it back to you. I know many companies are trying to get this right. And for the first time I've heard the FDA commissioner be really bold on this one for the last like month or so. So give us some light, some ideas. How do we fix this uh, summit? Well, we certainly are making some progress on that from our perspective. Let me start, I think you said it very correctly. I think it is about 18% of the US population that uh, falls in the Latinx uh, population by census, with less than 1% of the, them being uh, participants in clinical trials. I think numbers are pretty similar for the black population as well, less than 5% participation in clinical trials. And I think the reasons for the low participation is similar to what I spoke earlier about the mistrust, the lack of education, lack of information, lack of the diversity in the healthcare providers. So earlier this year, and it's always been in our DNA to look at diversity. I've been a big proponent of that right from the beginning. We did a few things and we made some commitments and we put ourselves to the task to really combat this as a beginning, uh, as one of the parts of the overall uh, ecosystem of healthcare. And we put our, our heads together and we've not committed basically about $300 million to be able to make a difference. We're actually working with academic institutions and societies and organizations uh, to be able to train about 250 fellows from the underrepresented communities and diverse communities who will continue their, their progress in the fellowship programs, but come out with a mentality of progressing enrollment of diverse and underrepresented communities into clinical trials. We're also working with similar organizations to also train 250 medical students who put that in the curriculum to really bring that thought of diversity right from the beginning so that by the time of 2025, at least 10% of these fellows who are being trained right now will come with a full fresh training and infrastructure for conducting clinical trials that will enroll diverse communities. We've also committed to uh, enroll at least 25% of the clinical trial sites in 10 urban areas and these urban areas chosen for higher population where the underrepresented communities actually live, such as uh, uh, looking at Dallas, looking at Detroit, looking at LA, looking at New York, in fact, parts of New York and many others. So we are committed towards those 25% of the sites in our pivotal trials starting next year. Now, going beyond that, I think it's important that we also hear from the patient. And so the other commitment we, we implemented actually already earlier this, this year is to listen and engage with the patients, our advocacy groups, to get that patient voice in the development programs. And I'm very happy to report that we, I think, now have 10 or 15 protocols that have already gone through that review process. We already have the patient voice in the clinical trial process. So I'm really proud that we've taken the first steps. But as you said, you know, this is just a drop in the ocean. We can't do it alone. It will have to be a community effort. It will have to be the whole ecosystem coming together. And then only we'll be able to really have an impact. This is not also a journey that we'll forget after maybe the vaccines become available. Maybe we'll forget about the pandemic. That's human brain. Uh, we do tend to forget the bad things very quickly. But this is something that we need to remember to continue to invest our time and our energy because this is the long-term game that we'll have to play. Thank you, that is fantastic. And those are such great ideas and interventions that you have in motion. And I am curious to hear what, you know, we're, we have learned and implemented in, in New York, Lisa, like you just went from, I love how you put it, like we, we were the ugly face <laughs> of the pandemic and it went from that to success. What are some of those things that, I guess, silver lining of having to manage through a crisis that became new solutions or interventions to to fill some of these gaps in care. Yes, thank you, Lily. I mean, I would mm -hmm. say it takes a village, right? Like, um, I don't think we've seen anything like this crisis in the century. 
um, that has made government play such a pivotal uh, role upon the impact of daily life. And, you know, I know that this question was framed of what can we look to as, as positive construction solutions and best practices, but um, I do want to just hit a couple of quick statistics um, to reverberate your fantastic slides and data points at the beginning of this con of this conversation. And one is that even though um, Latinos and Latinx community comprises 18.5% of the population, we um, comprise about a quarter of all COVID deaths. So 18.5% of the population for 24.2% of all COVID deaths. And um, what you said earlier about how our community is also more susceptible to chronic diseases like diabetes, four times more susceptible. Well, it's no coincidence that our hospitalization rate among Latinos is four times that of whites. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there is symmetry along those guidelines. From a government um, political perspective, what are those tried and true methods? I mean, I have to say there's nothing astounding, um, nothing glamorous about it, just a lot of hard work and grit. So I would say number one, testing. Um, you know, we went from literally, you know, ground zero to now conducting more than 200,000 tests a day in the state of New York, which is remarkable. Like if, you know, you turned back the clock and said that we could do that in April, it would have been sobering. Because remember, the start of the pandemic and why it so quickly grew is that if you don't know who's infected, right, the community spread just kept growing. So testing, 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 um, and then contact tracing. So we here in New York, we have over 4,000 contact tracers. That's another key vehicle because the faster that you trace someone who might have had, you know, close or proximate contact to an exposure, the, the faster you can like contain, right, the virus. So that is a key vehicle and 4,000 is proportionally a higher number than what other states employ. Um, so that that is also um, key. And, you know, like we're also uh, maximizing everything we can about data, about technology so that as we, you know, we really like calibrate, you know, our strategies daily. I can, I can reassure you that, but we're doing it because, you know, we're trying to beat this virus. And so for instance, um, at the start of the academic year, you know, we set up a, a school dashboard, you know, we require schools to report, not just for students, for staff. Um, we, we then initiated like a micro cluster strategy to be really specific and have um, you know, again, data fact filled um, updates that would resonate with people like, where is my block? You know, like literally like, am I on a safe block? Can I visit my loved ones? Um, and then I would say, you know, in closing, just like all those tried and true protocols. So washing your hands, keeping socially distant, you know, um, as a community Latinos, you know, we have different generations within one household. Um, we love familia, we love like getting together and the holidays are a key time, but you know, it is an important time. Like um, we just had Thanksgiving elapse. If you really want to show your love and support for your family members, this might be that holiday that instead of visiting, you know, your tias and abuelos and your primos, like stay home, be safe, you know, tell them how much you love them, you know, by FaceTime or some, you know, by, by phone, by laptop. But um, getting back to uh, what Sylvia was describing about our susceptibility as essential workers, as, you know, our community not really having a choice so much of being able to work remotely. Um, this speaks to the farm worker population. This also speaks to, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that, uh, keep um, meat and poultry uh, processing and packing plants, you know, delivery workers, um, supermarket uh, staff, like all the essential workers, um, you know, who have no choice. So again, advocacy, um, as, as Summit has, has spoken about, you know, or can you reach out to your local community organization? Um, where do you go for information? There's a lot of fear and mistrust a lot of consequences and concerns about immigration implications, just even signing up for vaccines, right? Um, so, you know, I hope that other mayors or governors, elected officials, or even if you're an advocate in your community or you um, have a close alliance with a community-based organization that is vocal, like, you know, hold leaders accountable. So um, last thing I would say on that point is, you know, just today, Governor Cuomo announced um, 
his commitment, our commitment in the state of New York to bridge those gaps um, across health equities. And he has been vocal with um, leadership from the a NAACP. And today we actually issued a letter um, that was signed in concert with 54 uh, groups, community groups here in the state of New York that have signed support to bridge those gaps. And we have also taken another stand in terms of um, our the beginning of our framework for vaccines. Um, the current the CDC under the current administration has asked for uh, personally identifiable information, private information um, that could be potentially shared with other federal agencies. And here in New York, the governor has said no. He's taken a stand because we don't know if this administration would share that PII you know information with ICE or another agency, right? And so, how do we? balance public health, but also keeping our community safe. So, you know, however the best practices here employed in New York can help inspire um, or engage other elected officials, whether in office or whether at home, right? Because we're all, we all have a voice. Um, we hope that New York has inspired and encouraged um, others across the country to do the same and to be a voice for Latinos. Thank you, Lisa. And I could have a three hour conversation with all of you. I'm, I'm looking at the time and I'm like, oh, I wish we could stretch it more. I'm going to try to wrap the one question for both Ruby and Sylvia, because I want to hear from you and the, your body of work in mental health with the farm worker community. Um, what are some of those best practices that maybe we can borrow, amplify, uh, expand beyond um, the pandemic? That, that will help us serve better our communities. Ruby, let's start with you for mental health. Yes, uh, uh, Lily, this is a great opportunity to talk about mental health. This is with the, um, not only for the Latino community, but in general, mental health always has been in the back, you know, of all the conditions. So now mental health at the front and we have um, more, you know, we we put mental health uh, on the table. So what we try to do is um, to uh, educate the community. What uh, do you? What can you do in order to manage your stress, mental health issues um, caused by COVID nineteen, for example? And telling about practical um, steps. You know, when when we advise people, what we are going to say to them. So. We know the social distance is 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 um, um, adding stress and, and anxiety, but um, they are really um, a lot of communication, stay, uh, ways to stay in touch with friends and family by phone, video, with the technology. But also, we advise to take a break from watching, reading, or listening the news. Um, you know, there are too many news. Um, and, and we advise to um, use trust information, trust sources, um, the Center for Disease Control, for example. Um, they are also some, um, the type, uh, we advise to try to maintain healthy diet, exercise, and, and sleep um, routine. Also uh, to contribute with, with local uh, food banks, um, with some neighbors have been created their own food bank. So all of these, um, all of these um, community help, uh, support, you know, you, the community should be more involved in those. Um, there are also to put on, uh, not to put, just to be for the origin emergency health care, not for chronic conditions. If you try to um, handle, the best for telemedicine or call, uh, avoid to go to the healthcare providers, hospitals. Um, if you cannot work, for example, uh, they are some uh, um, unemployment insurance from the states that change state by state. But uh, um, I think that we, we can connect the people um, with all of these resources. Also, also um, the prayer, meditation, uh, all the practice that um, can um, help during these difficult times. Um, they are also the, the opportunity to share stories about resilience, survival from the past, from the family, from the culture. So all of these, um, they are um, things that we uh, advise. 
And also one thing that, that we have um, is handy the hotlines of resources that we may have for the uh, community. And they are in Spanish, the Disaster um, Distress Helpline, the National Suicide Prevention Lifetime, the National, uh, they are um, Domestic Violence Hotline, they are in Spanish now. So uh, the suicide prevention, uh, so we, we try to um, communicate all of these resources to the Hispanic community so they can use those. Thank you so much, Ruby. Who knew that it took a pandemic for all of us globally to recognize that mental health is at the center of us keeping it all together, myself included. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia, how about from your farm worker uh, efforts? Are there any best practices or things you've seen that emerged in this season that maybe are worth investing in and expanding on. Absolutely, and and I want to catch them. I think for for the Latino community as a whole. I mean, certainly the farm worker community benefits from these as well. And and I want to hit on three major things that you know. First of all, and this is real. It's not new. It's not innovative, but I think it goes back to the resilience of our communities and and the trust. And so, really engaging our communities with mm -hmm. members of their own community. Mm -hmm. So the Promotoras de Salud program. I think that is a real key. I think that we've seen it expand throughout the country, um, but it is a program that that's isn't always fully financed. And so we see some um, communities that have expansion in those programs and then they lose funding. And so I think that they are critical in order for us to completely have that, um, that trust as well as provide that communication. I think our communities hear a lot of information and it's hard for them to decipher what's real, what's not real, what should they uh, what are the what is the guidance that they need to follow? And so promotoras de salud are really critical in regards to seeing them as part of that health team. Um, and then secondly, you talked about silver linings. And I'd like to talk about one in that it it, it is a way for us to increase access to healthcare services for farm workers, especially in remote areas, and that is telehealth, the use of telehealth. And so I think that as we look at how we can expand that, we also need to make sure that our communities can be fully engaged. You know, we've always been looking at health literacy, but now we need to look at digital literacy. And our families need to be able to uh, engage in that type of a service delivery model. And it's up to us to ensure that they not only have the proper equipment, but with that equipment that they know how to use it and know how to maneuver in a very digital society. And then lastly is, you know, sometimes it becomes very frustrating because a lot of the information and education and guidance that we receive is in English and then it's translated into Spanish. And that's not the same as developing materials in Spanish for our Latino communities. So I like to really emphasize that we really need to look at, we have the resources, we have the capacity to be able to develop those materials in the language that is preferred by our communities. And I think it makes a world of difference. It is not the same to translate than to develop in the language of our communities. I love it, Sylvia. Thank you so much. I've been taking notes here because I think for the last, but very important rapid fire type question, I'm gonna go off script for a second so that we can stay on time and leave with some action. Um, I'm going to go to each and every one of you, but if there was one thing we could do, right? This is the context and the moment of the Hispanic Leadership Summit 2020. Everything that we are all human is advocating for unifying us. There may be all of those partners you wish you could connect with that are watching right now. What, what is the one thing you wish we can do or get done as a community? And let's be focused because it is the Hispanic Summit, focus for the Hispanic Latinx community to achieve better health, to fill those gaps in care, 
to achieve and accelerate health equity. So I'm kind of extending my question so you can think about it. One thing, one thing, you have a magic wand. What is it that we can do together to get over all of these numbers, hospitalizations, bad outcomes? Let me start with you, Summit. Sure. Yes. Well, I'm the lucky one every time, so thank you, Lily. I think uh, it is not a nice to have, uh -huh. it's a must to have. And what I would say, combining what, what Sylvia said and what Lisa said, educate in the language that people understand, especially in the zip codes who don't speak English, give it to them in the language they understand and update the data as it becomes available. Because negative propaganda, I don't know who, who it helps, but that's making more noise than the positivity of the vaccines or anything else. Thank you. I, I'm going to go with how I see you in the tiles. Sylvia, you're next. You know, I'd like to say that if we could really establish a patient-centered health home mm. that extends beyond the healthcare facility, but into the community, and if we can think about it, then it it reaches our our Latino communities as well as it begins with prevention. And so in establishing that patient-centered health home, we already begin by looking at how can we prevent versus having to always be responding in a critical moment. Love it. That is the holy grail of healthcare, graduate from reacting to prevention. Uh, how about you, uh, Lisa? What is your kind of magic wand desire? Thanks, Lily. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to do a magic wand for today and a magic wand for tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> um, so since it's December and we're about to have the holidays, mine is please stay home. Please stay safe. Do not socialize. If you really love your family, um, this is not the time to have you know everybody at the mesa and have a big meal. It really is the time to stay safe. Um, magic one for tomorrow. I think part of the challenge of uh, breaking down these barriers is we need more uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx nurses, doctors, healthcare workers. Let's invigorate. Let's let's get a philanthropy, private and public sector to work together to have new generations and really amplify. Because if we have doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, voices that understand cultural competence, that people feel comfortable. To going to for help that's going to make a world of difference and be a voice for clinical trials and everything else so there you have it Lily. awesome i love that ruby you are closing us with your wish education i think that this is the world we need to educate people in the community not only about the diseases about mental health but also educate uh, with the idea to have more people in the healthcare profession more doctors more um to, that they have uh, you know the possibility to treat the, their own community so education in general i think that we conduct one study with lily where we um uh, realize that not only is the cultural part but also is important to educate the people about the condition the disease that has um, a solution has a treatment so i think the education is the key piece for me that is fantastic so i'm gonna close this with um kind of like a, a call to action that comes from Spider-Man, the movie. It says, with great power comes great responsibility. I feel each and every one of us here has the power of knowledge. Maybe those watching had the power of learning something new about the disparities, but don't let the numbers discourage us. It should motivate us to take action. We are contributing to 50% of the population growth of this country by the year 2040, we will be a majority minority nation. That is only two decades out. We either get this right now or it will be mathematically impossible for us to get rising cost of healthcare under control if all of these underlying disparities in chronic disease, access, outcomes, all the way upstream from clinical trials to the way we launch medicines and vaccines, if it's not culturally intelligent, we may be missing out on the growth segments, which are highly likely to be Hispanic, uh, to be served properly. So in your own words, we need that cultural intelligence in the materials and the language that we use. In the way we deliver care, maybe reimagining the patient-centered health home 
or the places and spaces where we intercept people for wellness in motivating careers in healthcare, all the way from pharmacy to tech aides to MDs and PhDs. And of course, all of that boils down to education, as Ruby said it. So let's go out, exercise our superpower as Spider-Man of cultural intelligence. And thank you so much for all the work you do. Thank you, we are all human. Claudia, for your leadership and for allowing us to have this very important conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. Thank you. Be well and stay home. <laughs>